To consider this Panasonic model number RC210 clock radio as just another boring member of the species would be to deny it the credit that it truly deserves. One of the most obvious aspects of this unit's design, although it may not be readily apparent from the camcorder's viewpoint, can be readily affirmed by use of a measuring tape across the unit. If we do that, we will find that this unit measures to just over a hair past one foot in width and clocks in at a gargantuan seven and a half inches worth of depth. If we take that same measuring tape and go across the speaker grill, it measures to about three and three quarter inches a diameter that is nearly completely filled by the underlying speaker, which would seem to suggest, at least on the surface, that this unit would have no problem delivering significant audio fidelity, even at substantial levels of volume. One thing is for sure, this unit is unusually large for its size. Large cabinets like this were usually reserved for clock radios with mechanical movements, and maybe Panasonic simply reused the cabinet from another model that had a mechanical movement. It is hard to tell. However, one thing cannot be denied, and that is the fact that happiness is accepting the fact that you have a huge clock radio. However, size is not this unit's only positive design aspect. To look at the other positive design aspects, we'll have to explore the unit a bit more closely. To start our tour of this particular clock radio, let's begin at the most logical place, the front panel. Unfortunately, you can see right away that this particular unit looks to have had some particularly severe use and wear over the years. However, it's still in good working condition, at least electronically speaking. This vacuum fluorescent display panel, a very common fixture of clock radios from the late 1970s, or in the case of this unit, the early 1980s, still appears to have exceptional emission. And while we're looking around with our measuring tape, for those of you who happen to be curious, the front panel of this unit from top to bottom measures right up to about three inches on our handy dandy little measuring tape. Looking closer at this vacuum fluorescent display, we can see there's not a whole heck of a lot going on here, but there is one particularly interesting character that appears between the AM and PM symbols, and it is this flashing line, which as you may have noticed is a little bit dimmer than the other characters, even the colons. Kind of surprising, as the colons would spend arguably more time turned on than this particular character does since it is blinking. This character actually indicates the passage of seconds. If you've been timing this with a stopwatch, and I sincerely hope that you haven't been because that's kind of a sad thing to do to be honest, you have probably already figured that out and are just waiting to type a comment telling me all about it. Well, you don't have to, because I assure you I know the functionality of that particular flashing line. More usefully, that flashing line could be used to synchronize this clock radio with another time source, such as the WWV broadcast here in the United States, or its equivalent if you happen to live in, in a country located outside of the United States. Looking toward the middle of the panel, we have the Panasonic brand name and the breathless description they chose for this product, calling it an electronic readout clock. I guess they thought that would help them sell more of these by making it sound perhaps more futuristic or exciting than simply calling it a digital electronic clock radio. Off to the right, we have the tuning dial scale. This is unique in the fact that it is not only backlit, but the backlighting is still working. Again, suggesting that this unit's overall hours of operation are perhaps not all that high. So there's really not anything terribly exciting about the front panel other than to point out the fact that it could be in better condition. This unit could do very well with some cleanup and maybe some light restoration. I would imagine that polishing this plastic face would do a lot to remove these scratches and that perhaps coloring this silver trim in with a silver paint pen might also help to hide some of the boo-boos that it has suffered over the years. Less obvious is what should be done about the various boo-boos that have occurred and have defaced the wood grain trim on the unit, which is, of course, wood grain painted plastic. Now, we haven't really seen anything very exciting of this particular unit just yet, but bear with me, I'm getting closer to it. We have the usual card of controls here at the top. This is the snooze or doze button, as Panasonic chose to call it. When the alarm goes off, this gives you nine more minutes of repose before it goes off again. I don't know if, as on some other models, if multiple presses of this button are cumulative, it could go either way on an early electronic clock radio design such as this. 
we have the sleep timer button, and then we have the two radio controls, a small off button and a much larger on button. The exciting features start to appear when we pay more attention to this apart compartment, <laughs> I'll get it right sooner or later, that actually says clock controls. To open this, there is a small button here that clearly says push to open. And when you do that, it springs open with a great deal of vigor, revealing yet another set of controls. And the first of these controls is perhaps the most interesting of the bunch. It is not at all uncommon to find a clock radio that has variable brightness settings for its display. What is considerably less common is to find a clock radio equipped such as this one that allows for infinite adjustment of the display. To give you a better idea here, I'll go ahead and shut off the auxiliary light I've been using so you can see more of the light from the vacuum fluorescent display panel. I'll go ahead and I'll turn this control all the way down. It gets a lot dimmer than the camcorder would seem to indicate, but the effect should be much more apparent as we start to wind the brightness up. And you can see that this vacuum fluorescent display obviously has a ton of emission. As awesome as vacuum fluorescent displays are, the one very unfortunate thing about them is the fact that as they operate over the years, they poison themselves, and characters that have been illuminated for a longer period of time tend to grow quite dim. This happens because you have a series of filament heater lines that emit electrons when they are energized. In fact, if we turn on night shot, you'll probably be able to see them. You can see them right there. There's one right above the PM symbol. There's one just below the AM symbol. There are probably more beyond that. And in some cases, they may emit enough infrared radiation that the Handycam's night shot mode could pick them up. Alas, such does not appear to be the case in the instance of this particular unit. But as time goes by, those heater lines begin to lose their coating and lose their ability to emit electrons because all the electrons they have emitted have now become trapped at the back of the display panel. And eventually that leads to the display becoming dark. Now one thing you can do that can at least temporarily ameliorate this situation is to boost up the filament voltage. But if you do that, you run the risk of greatly uh, decreasing the panel's lifetime, either by depleting the emission material from the filaments even more quickly, or by causing the filaments to actually burn out, rendering the display very useless. But these vacuum fluorescent displays, in addition to being awesome, are also, as the name would suggest, basically a glorified fluorescent light bulb that can be individually addressed. And unfortunately, they are something that you just do not see on clock radios in this modern day and age. LED displays and backlit LCDs have most certainly taken their place. Continuing our look at the controls under this panel, we have the fast and slow setting buttons. There is no reverse setting, and in the case of this unit, it would have been really nice if Panasonic had decided to include one, because when you use the fast adjustment control on this thing, well, it's not just fast, it's way, 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 way too fast. And it has a bad habit for whatever reason. Maybe this is a defect in this particular example of choosing to jump ahead enormous amounts of time when you remove your finger from the control. It's easy to lose an entire hour or more. It's kind of like being on the whiskey diet where you can lose a matter of days in very short succession. <laughs> Fortunately, they do give us a slow time adjustment control. Otherwise, I would forget about ever setting this unit to the correct time of day. And then to prevent accidental adjustment to either the time of day or the alarm settings, there is a time set controller lever that allows you to choose between adjusting the time of day, leaving the unit locked so that no adjustments can be made. You can see I'll push these buttons and nothing will happen. You can also choose to set the alarm on the unit. We will have a demonstration of this unit's alarm tone a little bit later. Speaking of the alarm tone, here is the alarm selector. This allows you to choose between an alarm tone, no alarm at all, or automatic operation, which turns on the radio in this particular case. Speaking of the radio, this unit is a pretty average two-band AM-FM set. It tunes the entirety of the 88 to 108 megahertz FM band, and then on the AM band, it tunes from 530 to 1,600 kilohertz on the AM scale. And then, 
there is the volume control. Panasonic must have used a knob like this for years, although they did so in many different colors. And continuing our exploration of the radio controls, here is the tuning dial. This sets tuner, operates very decisively and effectively, unlike some of these I have seen where the tuning has unfortunately slipped. Going around to the back side of the unit reveals perhaps the most interesting series of capabilities seen so far. This could be a clock radio for very serious FM listeners, although unfortunately serious enthusiasts of the medium wave AM broadcast band are left out of the fun because this unit does not have a set of AM antenna connectors. It does, however, have provisions for connection of an external FM antenna. There appears to be a built-in FM antenna that is at least sufficient for local reception. It's probably one of those deals where a wire is run from the tuner circuit board and wrapped around the power cord numerous times. But if that's not enough, this set has you covered, and this is something else that you would see on very few, if any, modern clock radios. It's also very easy to use because these are simply spring clips that can be depressed, a wire pushed in, and when the spring clip is released, it will be the wire will be held securely in place. This is perhaps the most interesting aspect of this entire design, of this clock radio's entire design, and I haven't been able to find out much about this. It is suggested that this clock radio can control not only the alarm and the radio, it can also control an external appliance using the RD9949 appliance control kit. I have tried to do some research on that. I've never seen one. I can't find any pictures of one. I have no idea how it works. My guess is that this particular connector provides power, maybe even signaling, although it's a simple uh, tip and ring style barrel jack, if those are even the correct terms to use as would be seen on numerous power adapters. And I don't know if this thing would send signals over the power line, similar to how X10 signaling device or wireless plug-in and use intercoms would work, or if it's actually something that ends up being plugged in directly to a device and also plugs in to get AC power of its own. If you know something about this item, or you have one and you've made a video about it, I'd love to hear about it. Please feel free to post a link in the uh, comments area and although you can't make a video response anymore, you can include a link to a video if you would like to do so. You can see there are some open vents here on the back side of the cabinet. My guess is that these are designed to give this unit's power transformer a little more breathing room. To round out our visual tour of this unit, here we are looking at the underside of this particular clock radio. And if you know Panasonic clock radios at all, you will have noticed something very interesting about this particular model, something that is not often seen on other Panasonic clock radio models from the 1980s with vacuum fluorescent displays, and that is the connection point as well as a receptacle for a 9-volt battery. Again, this has a very interesting design. It looks like Panasonic was trying to make things at least marginally user-friendly here, because in addition to the contact points for the battery, there's also this little flap on the end that probably serves to make it a little bit easier to grasp this and disconnect a depleted battery, which of course, in my experience, the batteries used for these backup functions become depleted exceptionally quickly. And maybe that explains why Panasonic simply didn't bother including them on later models. Not to mention the fact that I have also noticed that the accuracy of the timekeeping tends to vary quite widely with all of the clock radios that I have ever fitted a 9 volt battery to and subsequently had them go through a power outage. You can see that there is a diagram discussing how to connect the 9 volt battery, although it's pretty hard to do it incorrectly. Also tells you what kind of battery to use and a little bit of a blurb telling us about what will happen when the product is unplugged and we should remove the battery so that it doesn't leak. This notice is not only in English, it also appears to be in French, suggesting that this model may have been marketed overseas or even to our neighbors of up to the north, that is to say Canada. Looking down here, we have the serial number 812609A49714. I would take the 81 and the 26 as a possible date code. I'm not sure about 09A. 
but I could see that very definitely being the 26th week of 1981, which again makes this an unusually large unit for its time. I wonder if maybe Panasonic had reused the cabinet from a clock radio with a much larger, perhaps even mechanically operated, flip clock style movement or similar. Here's another warning in French on the bottom of the unit. And then over here, I believe, is the same warning in English telling us not to take the unit apart as it contains no user serviceable parts. And then here is the information plate, Panasonic, model number RC210, AC 120 volts, 60 hertz, 8 watts, complies with the FCC rules, and was manufactured by Matsushita Electric Industrial Company Limited of Japan. It is, of course, also UL listed. And with all those interesting little tidbits out of the way, it's time for the moment you've all been waiting for, a demonstration of this unit's audio quality, fidelity, and tuning capability. And of course, tuning anything down here in the basement full of computer junk and computer-generated RF interference could be quite a miracle, especially on the AM band. So let's go ahead and try it out and see how well it happens to do. One thing is for sure, this thing certainly does manage to stand up and deliver quite impressively in terms of sheer sound output, and the quality's not too bad either. The music that was playing on that particular station doesn't do justice to how well this thing can reproduce bass, but maybe in our band scan we'll find something that does give it a little bit more of a fair shake. I have noticed that when you turn the radio on in this and the dial lights up, that the vacuum fluorescent clock display dims ever so slightly. I don't think this indicates a problem. It's probably just lax power supply regulation, as the power supplies in these things do not have to be regulated to an especially tight standard. And in many LED display clocks, you can oftentimes note that there will be variances in brightness depending upon how many of the individual segments in the display are lit, also indicating that those clock radios do not regulate their power supplies particularly tightly either because, well, it's just not necessary. So let's go ahead and turn the volume back up here, and we'll do our band scan. Go down to the bottom of the band here. Probably won't hear very much. Hmm, that must be the motorboat channel. <laughs> there's the piano music station, as V-West Life always calls it. And I always feel compelled for some strange reason to point it out. My apologies to headphone users. Hmm, dead carrier there. Dead audio, plenty of carrier though, apparently. We're not really getting a whole lot down here. Maybe I should connect an external FM antenna and try again. We'll see if we can get anything on the AM band, though. I would expect even less than FM in this case. It really does have surprisingly wideband audio when tuning AM stations. Those further processed items that we see in the basket. The complete summer cookout is available online at fb.org. No new year budget, Illinois lawmakers. So some of them planning to adopt a one-month temporary budget today to avoid uh, potential. I 
rev our brains up. Our brains have been enhanced over millennia. And so what if they're already running as they should be? And if we make them try to run more efficiently, faster, become better at something, what is the long-term effect? Are we going to die sooner? Are we going to get dementia sooner? All of these health questions. We well, it took me a little while to find everything I needed to get this thing hooked up to the external antenna I'm using my TV antenna outside. And as you can see, as part of my unwavering commitment to the highest quality techniques possible anywhere, I have used twist ties to hook up the uh, FM output side of this signal splitter to the inputs on the clock radio. It did not lead to the profound improvement that I'd hoped for. And to be honest, I don't know if my TV antenna has an FM trap on it or not, because I'm way too much of a chicken, too afraid of heights, to go up there and find out. Which also means it has precluded me from replacing it, because it's kind of made of pressed and dried garbage. But there was a little bit of an improvement. And just to round out this video, here's a better demonstration of this unit's AM reception capability. Please do forgive the hum in the audio. Setting up an AM transmitter is sometimes fraught with complications, and this one is no different. But it's actually running in my closet three floors up. So how do I start the broadcast? Well, let's just say that VNC control of a computer is an absolutely amazing thing. So go ahead and turn the volume up here, just to give you a demonstration. And before we get tagged for copyright, we'll put another song on. There is some delay as the audio processor catches up. You know the crowd was very small for a country music show. But he thanked a curtain call just like it was years ago. And just when you thought you might get away from one of my videos without hearing me say it, well, you're wrong. Thank you as always for watching, and feel free to leave a comment if you happen to have one.